Greetings and welcome once again to the Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and it's always great to have you back with me to talk about military history. I'd like to say I hope my American listeners had a happy 4th of July. This holiday was always my favorite, even more than Christmas. Aside from the fireworks and not having to go to school, where I grew up in St. Louis, there was the VP Fair down by the Arch, which had a great air show over the Mississippi River. And Channel 11, an independent TV station in the city, would usually do a marathon of Three Stooges episodes and old 60s and 70s war movies. Classics like Midway and A Bridge Too Far being played for hours on end. And since it was summer and hot out, I usually read about the Pacific campaigns around this time, since I figured all the carrier battles took place in hot, summery weather. This is how my kid mind worked, and I'd usually read about the Pacific in the summer in the European theater, where it seemed like it was usually overcast in the winter and the fall. In any case, I still feel this way somewhat today, so I'm excited to start a new series, which I'll be putting out interspersed with the remainder of the Rift War series. This one will focus on the development and career of the classic Douglas SBD carrier dive bomber. This aircraft was an essential part of the American naval arsenal in the crucial carrier battles of the first year of the war, and in every Pacific campaign to follow, as well as a surprising amount of lesser-known service in the Atlantic and with the air services of the Allied nations. Like its German counterpart in Europe, the Ju-87 Stuka, the Dauntless was bordering on obsolescence when its involvement in the global struggle began, but despite this, it very quickly proved itself to be an exceptionally accurate and reliable strike aircraft. Also like the Stuka, the Dauntless remained in service long after its intended replacement had entered service, and was adapted to perform tactical roles not envisaged for it when originally conceived. My sources for this series will be Douglas SBD Dauntless by Peter C. Smith and SBD Dauntless Units of World War II, an Osprey book written by Barrett Tillman. I'll also be using information graciously provided by the National Museum of the Marine Corps. This was very helpfully provided to me by Mr. Eric Marr, the Assistant Aviation Curator for the museum, who reached out to me and pointed me to a website of the History Division of the U.S. Marine Corps University, which hosts a huge selection of historical materials in books in PDF form, many of which are otherwise out of print. It's definitely an extremely useful resource. It can be found at usmcu.edu, where you can also find out about the National Museum of the Marine Corps. This looks like a first-class facility. It has a collection of 60,000 items dating all the way back to the beginning of the Corps in 1775, including uniforms and aircraft and weapons, vehicles, medals, flags, artwork, and other interesting bits of kit. It certainly looks like it would be worth a trip to Triangle, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C., once the COVID restrictions are lifted. I'll include a link to the publications list in my description of this episode. Thanks again, Mr. Marr. So now, with that out of the way, let's take a look at what kind of aircraft the Dauntless was and what kind of mission it was intended to carry out. The concept of dive bombing had been the subject of experimentation as far back as the First World War. Very early on, airmen had found that flying an aircraft as a whole towards the target made aiming bombs and gunfire a much easier task, especially in the days before bomb sites and other aiming aids. The first systematic use of the technique was carried out by the British in 1917. The first efforts to investigate the idea methodically were also carried out by the British during the closing years of the war. However, promising as the results of these early efforts were, they were practically abandoned with the drastic defense cutbacks of the immediate post-war years. Interest in the technique after the war was practically limited to the U.S. Army Air Service, the aviation branch of the U.S. Army, and the predecessor to the U.S. Army Air Corps and later Army Air Force. Changes in U.S. Army ideas about the best use of air power, however, meant that the development of tactical doctrine or suitable aircraft for dive bombing missions was drastically curtailed in the later 1920s. The reasons were identical to the parallel development in the British service, namely a much reduced peacetime budget and a shift in doctrine which emphasized the role of the long-range heavy bomber as the major war-winning weapon. However, the development of the dive bomber as an aircraft type and dive bombing as a distinct tactical niche was only briefly interrupted. U.S. Army's sister service, the Navy, along with the U.S. Marine Corps, which is organizationally a part of the Navy, picked up the thread in the late 1920s. Trials of steep angle diving attacks were conducted using Curtis F-6C fighters from VF-2, a Navy fighter squadron, as early as March of 1926. The F-6C was a navalized version of the Army's P-1 Hawk fighter, a one-man biplane with a liquid-cooled engine and fixed landing gear. The squadron was normally based aboard the carrier USS Langley at the time. Later, a more systematic series of mock attacks were flown from the North Island Naval Air Station under the leadership of Captain Joseph Mason Reeves. These trials seemed to indicate that this mode of attack was considerably more accurate than the normal bombing methods. 
As a result, the testing program was expanded, and the Navy Hawks were joined by a variety of contemporary naval fighters and scout planes to judge their suitability for this type of tactical mission. The principal problems encountered by unspecialized aircraft in a steep dive, namely controllability issues as speed builds up and the tremendous g-forces exerted on the aircraft structure in pulling out of such a dive, were revealed in the first rounds of these tests. The loss of several planes, which lost control or disintegrated in mid-air, caused some hesitation on the part of naval authorities, some of whom questioned the practicality of the technique. Due to this, most of the dives and the experiments to be conducted over the next year or two were conducted at a relatively shallow angle of 45 degrees or less, so as to not exceed the stress limitations of the aircraft involved. Even in such shallow dives, the improvement in bombing accuracy over conventional level bombing was remarkable. This method, it seemed, could make relatively small planes capable of hauling only a bomb or two each into effective anti-ship strike weapons. These further experiments proved promising, and a demonstration of the technique by VF-2 in October of 1926 was held at Long Beach, California. This consisted of a program of mock diving attacks on a division of battleships from the Pacific Fleet. The pilots began their dives at 12,000 feet, and their attacks impressed the senior fleet officers, of whom Admiral F.D. Wagner wrote, quote, This was the first dive bombing as such that we had ever heard of, and the reactions of the battleship commanders were most interesting. The general consensus was that there was no defense against it. Meanwhile, very similar experiments had been carried out on the East Coast under the direction of Rear Admiral A.C. Davis. These trials also indicated that pilots using the technique could achieve unparalleled accuracy compared to normal bombing methods. This was especially relevant in the context of naval warfare, where so many of the targets would be relatively small and compact ships maneuvering at high speed. Little confidence was placed in the ability of level bombers at altitude to hit moving ships, despite the demonstrations arranged with the Army under the auspices of Major Billy Mitchell. In these series of bombing tests against obsolete U.S. battleships and warships taken as prizes from the navies of the Central Powers after World War I, Army twin-engine bombers had succeeded in crippling stationary, unmanned ships of all sizes. Although these tests had demonstrated that airdropped bombs could demolish any warship up to and including a battleship, this was less impressive to naval men than it was to the general public. No one seriously doubted that hitting any ship with enough 1,000-pound bombs would wreck it. The problem was hitting a moving, dodging ship with anti-aircraft armament firing back, with damage control parties active, and with a possible fighter defense engaging the bombers. If anything, the Mitchell demonstration argued against the capability of contemporary bombers to threaten operational capital ships. The bombers involved had required multiple attacks to achieve significant damage, and the probability that these attacks would have succeeded against moving ships was low, and any damage that was inflicted was likely to have been under control by the time the next wave of large, slow, and fragile bombers arrived to face the air defense. These very well-publicized bombing trials could be cited instead as evidence that 1920s-era aircraft would constitute little real threat to well-handled warships. It was not a far step beyond this to predict that level bombing of the kind carried out by the Army bombers in these tests would remain ineffective in this context until aircraft and weapons technology had progressed well beyond the then-current state of the art. One result of this was that the anti-aircraft armament of many of the warships completed in the interwar period, which were built with these kinds of threats in mind, was revealed to be woefully inadequate against the much more capable aircraft and anti-shipping strike techniques of the early 1940s. Given the Navy's lack of confidence in level bombing to achieve worthwhile results against ships, and the size limitations placed on aircraft projected to operate from the Navy's aircraft carriers, it is not surprising that the findings of the dive bombing tests were met with enthusiasm. Using this method, it seemed, a relatively small aircraft carrying a single bomb could become an effective weapon against enemy warships, and the airplane could become a major threat to an enemy fleet. The aircraft currently on hand could only lift a 500-pound bomb. Even an armor-piercing bomb of this size was a very limited utility against capital ships and more heavily armored cruisers. Against more lightly protected vessels such as destroyers and submarines, patrol craft, auxiliaries, merchant ships, and wooden-decked aircraft carriers, however, such a payload could be devastating or even fatal. Given the increase in capability that could be expected from coming generations of aircraft, it was reasonable to assume that dive bombers capable of delivering pounds of 1,000 pounds or more with unprecedented accuracy would be available relatively soon. These would be a serious threat even to heavily protected battleships. It would be the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps, therefore, that would continue the development of this kind of aircraft and mission profile into the age of the all-metal monoplane. The Navy experimental program was observed with considerable interest abroad. 
air forces, which were to make extensive use of the specialized dive bomber in the coming world conflict, namely the German Luftwaffe, the Imperial Japanese Navy, and the British Fleet Air Arm, would model their basic tactics on the American method and adopt many of the specialized items of equipment developed during these trials. The initial Navy experiments, performed with the regular naval fighters of the day, were so successful that a considerable controversy raged within the naval establishment as to whether or not a specialized dive bomber type was even necessary. However, further tests of the method were performed in 1927, in which fighters made dives on a target platform towed behind a destroyer at a speed of 20 knots. The results were evaluated by a commission known as the Taylor Board to determine the likely potential of the dive bombing mission as part of the fleet's arsenal against a strong opponent. This board returned a firm judgment of the specialized dive bomber question, recommending that purpose-built dedicated dive bombers become a requirement for naval aviation. Dual-purpose fighter-slash-dive bombers were dismissed as, quote, inefficient hybrids. Due to this decision, development work on the first American dive bombers went forward in 1928. First of these, despite the recommendation of the Taylor Board, was indeed a converted fighter design. This was the Curtis XF-8C-2, a derivative of the company's Falcon biplane, then entering service with the Navy as the F-8C fighter. The converted Falcon was an aircraft of conventional appearance, with fabric-covered structure of steel and aluminum tubing, powered by a Pratt & Whitney Wasp R-1340-B radial engine rated at 450 horsepower. The XF-8C-2 could make a speed of just under 150 miles per hour, or 240 kph, and could carry a single 500-pound bomb. This prototype proved to be very successful, and the production of the F-8C dive bomber conversions began in 1927 with a batch of 25-4 models and 20-5s. These dive bomber variants of the Falcon Fighter were the first of three Navy dive bombers to bear the name Hell Diver. While these first-generation Hell Divers were entering service, the potential of the dive bomber was already moving towards the increased attack potential that the naval aviators envisioned for the type and testing began on the XT-2M, which was capable of delivering a 1,000-pound bomb in a diving attack. These pioneering aircraft were to confirm the effectiveness of the dive bombing technique. As a contemporary observer noted in a lecture at the Naval War College that spring, quote, Bombs are released at an altitude of 1,500 feet or less. Target practice conducted against targets towed at a speed of 20 knots in the open sea indicated an accuracy of about 30% hits on a destroyer target, in a neighborhood of 50% on a light cruiser target, and approximately 60% on battleship targets. Now it seemed, the naval strike aircraft had become a credible threat to an enemy navy. The first dive bomber designed as such from the beginning would be ordered in 1931. Product of the Martin Company, this is called the BM-1. It had a maximum takeoff weight of 6,500 pounds and could deliver a 1,000 pound bomb in a steep diving attack. Defensive armament was typical of two-seaters of the type, with one 30 caliber machine gun firing forward and another in a ring mount in the rear cockpit. Fitted with a 650 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R-1690-44 radial engine, it was slow even by the standards of the day, with a top speed of only 146 miles per hour, or about 235 kph. Though the two-seat BM-1 was a biplane of conventional appearance, it was built much more strongly than its contemporaries and could withstand a stress of 9G. This is far in excess of the tolerance of most present-day aircraft, and enabled the plane to withstand the force exerted by the pullout of a full-speed vertical dive. This aircraft would feature some special items of equipment meant to adapt to the specific problems of the steep diving attack. One of the problems encountered in the trials was that presented by the fixed landing gear of the fighters used in the test. The bomb would often strike the gear members after release at attack angles. This, along with reliability issues with the engines then in service, was the issue which had led to the discontinuation of the original British test program in 1917. The odds of the dive bomber's bomb hitting the undercarriage or propeller was very high if it was carried on the center line under the fuselage, which was the only practical point of attachment for bombs of a worthwhile size. When the Navy encountered this problem, experiments were conducted at the Dahlgren Proving Grounds, using movie cameras to film the path of the bombs after release at various dive angles. It was hoped that by this means, a maximum safe angle of release could be found. However, the comparison of the films with the reports of the test pilots revealed that it was very common for the pilot to mistake his dive angle by as much as 30 degrees. This would render any maximum release angle useless, as normal human error would make it very likely that pilots would simply be unable to observe the limit in a combat situation. 
So the solution was found in a simple automatically acting device, which is called the bombing crutch. This was a long U-shaped metal arm to which the bomb was mounted. The arm was attached to the underside of the aircraft by a pivoting hinge. When the pilot released the bomb, this hinge would unlock, and the arm swing outward away from the fuselage due to centrifugal force, releasing the bomb at the end of its travel, thus removing any danger of the missile striking the landing gear of the propeller. This simple device was incorporated not only into American dive bombers, but into those of the other powers which built planes of this kind. Another change in practice in response to this same problem was the use of special slow-arming fuses for the bombs the dive bombers carried, ensuring that the weapon would remain unarmed until well clear of the bomber. The BM-1 was ordered into production in April 1931. Twelve were flying from U.S. carriers by July of the next year, with 21 improved models, known as BM-2s, arriving soon after. The procurement of this aircraft in small numbers such as this was not unusual in the American air services of the interwar years. It's mainly the result of the very limited military funding available, and it accounts for the many different types of aircraft serving in the rather small American air services of this era compared to the relatively few varieties serving in the much larger air forces the U.S. would field in later years. Also, despite the Martin Company's pioneering work in this new kind of military aircraft, they would not make another dive bomber until the very last of the kind were already being phased out in 1948, when the AM-1 Mauler joined the fleet. By the time the BM series were entering service in the scout bomber role, the Navy was already looking for new aircraft to fill the complementary tactical niche of heavy dive bomber. This requirement called for a two-man plane, capable of hauling a 1,000-pound bomb for 400 miles, 650 kilometers, or a 500-pounder for twice as far. This type of aircraft was meant to complement machines like the BM-1s and 2s as part of a carrier air group. The evolution of naval doctrine regarding carrier aircraft saw the former types used as scouts with a secondary bombing capacity, while the heavy dive bombers would act as the major strike weapons with a secondary reconnaissance function. The aircraft that was chosen to fill this new dive bomber role was the product of the Great Lakes Airplane Company, which was known as the BG-1. These were developed from the Martin T-4M biplane torpedo bomber, 50 of which were built by Great Lakes previously. Though this aircraft was considered the heavier bomber in tactical terms, it was slightly smaller physically than the BM. It was also one of the first Navy planes to use the new R-1535 Twin Wasp radial, and this the Dash 82 model. This was a 14-cylinder, two-row radial engine with a dry weight of just over 1,000 pounds, just less than 500 kilograms. Various marks of the Twin Wasp would power many Navy airplanes in the early 1930s, this engine developed 750 horsepower and gave the BG a top speed of 188 miles per hour, or 302 kph, making considerably faster than the BM-1, and it could fly 3,700 feet or 1,100 meters higher to a ceiling of just over 20,000. It could carry a 1,000-pound bomb to a range of a little over 500 miles. The first of these new planes entered Navy service in October of 1934. Not long after the BG began flying, the Navy began setting up design competitions for the next generations of these two kinds of carrier bombers. The new Navy requirements called for a scout bomber with a loaded weight of 5,000 pounds and a normal bomb load of 500 pounds, and a dive bomber of 6,000 pounds weight with a 1,000 pound bomb load. These aircraft were to have better performance than the first generation strike planes and carrier service, and they were to incorporate the bombing crutch and the newly developed dive brakes, which made control and accuracy in the dive much greater. In order to allow the new bombers to operate from the carriers then in service, a 65 mile per hour or 105 kph landing speed was mandated. Several designs were submitted to fulfill this requirement. Some, like the Great Lakes XB2G and the Curtis SBC, were biplane designs, but most were monoplanes of a kind that were coming to fill most combat aircraft roles. Among these was the Brewster XSBA-1, a very advanced mid-wing monoplane design with fully retractable landing gear. Unfortunately, the Brewster company proved unable to actually produce this aircraft, but the concept was taken up in late 1935 by the Naval Aircraft Factory, a Navy-operated manufacturing facility at the Philadelphia Naval Yard which conducted development work as well as series production in this period. A limited batch of 30 of these planes were built here under the designation SBN-1. The lines of early 1940s carrier aircraft first emerged in these experimental models, which combined the appearance of the Grumman F-4F Wildcat fighter with those of the two-seat torpedo observation and strike aircraft, such as the Avenger and the Kingfisher, that it would serve alongside. 
However, this promising aircraft was never put into extensive service, and its potential was instead realized in these later generations of naval aircraft. One of the designs chosen for development was a biplane, and this was the Curtis SBC mentioned before. This is an all-metal aircraft broadly similar to the older biplanes, but of more advanced construction with an incrementally increased performance. The SBC featured retractable landing gear, but this was not actuated hydraulically or electrically and had to be cranked up and down by hand. Since this would usually have to be done while landing or taking off, and often while flying in close formation, this was no small feat on the part of the pilot. These biplanes, which would be named Hell Divers after their ancestors of the late 1920s, Falcon fighter conversions, would eventually come to serve on naval carriers throughout the later 30s, along with the monoplane types we will next consider. The career of the second generation Helldiver was in large part a result of the conservatism in some parts of the Navy and the Bureau of Ordnance. It would, in fact, be the last biplane of any kind procured by the U.S. Navy. Although it was an important contemporary dive bomber, the SBC was, was essentially unrelated to the development track that resulted in the SBD and represented a kind of insurance against the unexpected failure of the monoplane program. Nevertheless, the second-generation Hell Divers were reliable and useful aircraft. Though obsolete at the time of the U.S. entry into war, they would continue to fly with the Navy in training and other non-combat roles all the way into 1944. However, the day of the biplane was rapidly passing even as the SBC entered service. The requirement that resulted in the SBC also produced a pair of aircraft that represented the next stage of carrier-bomber evolution and brought the type into the age of the all-metal, closed-cockpit, cantilevered monoplane. Two such aircraft would eventually enter production to fill the Navy's dive-bomber requirements as outlined in 1935. The first of these was the design of the Chance Vought Company, the SB-2U. This plane, which would become to be known as the Vindicator, made its first flight soon after the start of that year. A two-man, low-wing monoplane powered by the R-1535-94 radial engine it was capable of 257 miles per hour, about 415 kph at altitude. The Vindicator could carry a 1,500-pound bomb load and could be fitted with drop tanks to extend its range. These capabilities allowed this aircraft to perform the functions of both scout bomber and dive bomber. 240 of these would be built for the Navy and Marine Corps, and they saw extensive service both flying from shore stations and aboard the pre-war carrier fleet. Though a pretty modern design, the Vindicator was not entirely satisfactory. Like many such aircraft of its day, advances in engine power had yet to reach the point where the full potential of the monoplane could be exploited, and the SB-2U was underpowered. It became known among naval aircrew as the quote, wind indicator, due to its sometimes sluggish performance. Worse, the engine had a tendency to fail when in a steep dive. This problem with the R-1535 radial, which powered most of the aircraft in this category at this time, threatened to end the dive bomber program altogether. The problem was due to the unusual barometric and g-forces at work on the engine during the dive, and intensive work by engineers at the Pratt & Whitney Company finally resolved the problem, but not before two years had passed. By the time of the war with Japan, the Vindicators were mainly shore-based, although some still flew from the carriers USS Wasp and USS Ranger. Some did see combat service in the first year of the war, principally in marine hands, flying from land bases. Perhaps their most notable actions were those flown during the Battle of Midway, when Marine Vindicators based on the island flew against the Japanese fleet. The other monoplane prototype chosen for development was also a design intended to fill both scout bomber and dive bomber roles. This was the XBT-1, product of the Northrop Company. This aircraft was the direct predecessor to the SBD, and it is with this prototype that the story of the Dauntless really begins. The XBT-1 was the brainchild of Ed Heinemann, a designer working at the time for the Northrop Company. This man had recently left the Douglas Company, which had itself been instrumental in the formation of Northrop not long before. The dive bomber design was developed from a Northrop Army attack aircraft, the A-17. Same basic design, fitted with newer versions of the R-1535 engine, the Dash 66 model, was reworked into a carrier bomber. The XBT was a two-man, low-wing monoplane, and differed from the A-17 mainly in the use of a semi-retractable undercarriage in place of the Army machine's fixed gear. In this system, the main gear legs folded backwards into bathtub-type fairings on the undersides of the wings. A fully retracting system was not feasible on this aircraft due to the internal structure of its wings, 
which featured a cellular arrangement characteristic of Northrop designs. Given early 30s materials and methods, structures like these were necessary to enable the aircraft to maintain its strength without external braces and struts. The first XBT flew in August 1935. It proved to be slower than its Army counterpart, topping out at just 185 miles per hour, about 300 kph, in comparison to the A-17's 205 miles per hour, or 330 kph. The XBT could carry a 1,000 pound bomb, however, in comparison to the A-17's 600 pound payload. The defect in speed was remedied by the replacement of the Dash 66 Twin Wasp with the more powerful Dash 94 model, which could develop 825 horsepower. This boosted the plane's speed to 212 miles per hour, or 340 kph, and raised its ceiling with payload to 22,500 feet, or 6850 meters. The change in engine also allowed a shortening of the engine cowling, bringing the aircraft closer to its final appearance. For defense, the XBT was fitted with a single 50 caliber machine gun firing forward. Provision was made for a flexibly mounted 30 caliber in the rear cockpit, but this was not incorporated into the prototype. The XBT did incorporate a new device developed specifically for the dive bombing mission, and another one which had become a regular part of the equipment of these types of machines. These were dive brakes, large flaps on the trailing edges of the wings. Unlike regular landing flaps, which consisted of a hinge panel which could be lowered, the dive brakes consisted of two trailing edge panels that could open upwards and downwards, causing immense drag and greatly retarding the buildup of speed in a steep dive, and enabling the pilot to more easily maintain control and accuracy on his machine in the attack. This system was described by Heinemann as such, quote, I designed a double concentric cylinder hydraulic control mechanism which permitted either the lower flap to be extended for takeoff and landing, or both upper and lower flaps extended for the dives. Both sets of flaps had to be carefully synchronized to avoid negative effects on the longitudinal trim during extension. These new flaps proved successful in the initial portion of the flight test program, which was concerned with basically level flight and shallow dives. As the dive angle became steeper, however, Severe buffeting began to be encountered when the brakes were extended. So bad would this become that pilots were reporting that the trailing edges of the tail surfaces were flapping up and down through a distance of 2 feet or 60 centimeters or more in steep dives. This was the result of turbulence resulting from vortices coming off the extended flaps. Unless corrected, this would threaten to tear apart any aircraft using the brakes in a steep dive. Research was carried out into possible solutions to this problem, Another, which could have meant the end of the dive bomber program altogether. A prominent engineer from the government-run National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, or the NACA, by the name of Ed Helm, was dispatched to Northrop's facility at El Segundo, California, to assist in the resolution of this problem. After much review of test flight data, a proposal was made to perforate the dive flaps with circular cutouts three inches in diameter. According to the working theory developed at El Segundo, this would set up eddies through the holes which would greatly reduce the violence of the vortices coming off the edges of the flaps. These holes were gradually extended to cover the entire flap surface, and were found to correct the problem with only an insignificant increase in stall speed. These Swiss cheese flaps would become an instantly recognizable feature of the Dauntless. Another serious engine-related problem was also discovered with the new R1535. Though this engine could be relied upon not to stall in the dive anymore, the unusual conditions encountered by the engine in the dive resulted in the alarming phenomenon known as engine torching. Tiny blobs of unburned fuel would be ejected through the exhaust manifold in steep diving conditions, igniting as they did so. This would lead to the XBT trailing an intense flaming trail in the dive, often extending as far as 30 feet beyond the tail of the plane, and hot enough to burn the paint off of the aircraft. This problem required more than 100 dive trials from altitude to isolate and correct. The courage of the XBT test pilots, writing down an unproven design that was violently shaking and engulfed in streams of burning fuel, should not be underestimated. Once these problems were solved, the XBT was handed over to the Navy, who would conduct their own trials. These were held at Anacostia Naval Air Station in Washington State. Here the aircraft encountered cold weather for the first time, which revealed more difficulties. Semi-retractable gear would frequently freeze in the up position, requiring the pilot to stooge around at low altitude until the members had warmed enough to lower. The canopy, which was composed of an early plastic material, was found to be prone to cracking at low temperatures. These problems were comparatively minor, however, and before long the aircraft was accepted for service. 
the production model, designated the BT-1, was powered by the 825 horsepower R1535-94, driving a two-bladed propeller. It could make 222 miles per hour, or 355 kph, while carrying a 1,000-pound bomb. The first batch of 54 was ordered on September 18, 1936, and this aircraft was produced concurrently with the Vindicator. The BT-1 served with squadrons VB-5 and VB-6 aboard the USS Enterprise and USS Yorktown in the years 1937 and 38. Along with the Vindicators, the BT-1s would replace the aging BM and BG series biplanes. The aircraft was a success, but the development process had so financially strained the new Northrop company that it was sold to Douglas in September of 1937. Douglas already owned a controlling share of Northrop's stock at the time of the sale, however, and the continuity of the BT project was little disturbed. Jack Northrop himself, however, was not satisfied with the new arrangement, and left to found a new Northrop company in the early days of 1938, which is why the name remains current in the American aviation industry of the day. These rapid changes of ownership and control were very commonplace in the American aviation industry of the time. Aircraft manufacturing and aviation in general was a precarious business in peacetime America. The infrastructure of commercial aviation for the most part still lay in the future, and without government orders in the form of military aircraft, it was only a small and unstable market for airplanes. This may seem counterintuitive given that these years are sometimes referred to as the golden age of aviation. In many respects it was, but for aviation as a paying business it was definitely a hard time. Buyouts and refoundings of sold or bankrupt companies were very frequent, and it should by no means be assumed that simply because a manufacturer's name appears in different years or periods that it denotes the same company. The case of Northrop here is very typical. The Northrop companies in 1936 and 1938 were entirely different organizations, with the earlier Northrop company having much more in common with the Douglas company, which was its parent, than it did with the later Northrop company, which was basically unrelated. This is why it is often found that, as in this case, the design originally created by one company ended up becoming known to history as another company's project. Be that as it may, development of the BT series aircraft was carried forward by Douglas after Northrop's departure. The last two BT-1s of the original production batch were finished as experimental models. One was used to conduct landing tests using tricycle landing gear with a steerable nose wheel. The second was completed as an incremental improvement of the BT-1, and became the second prototype of the series, designated XBT-2. This aircraft was the immediate predecessor to the SBD. The principal differences from the BT-1 were the new one-piece cockpit canopy, somewhat enlarged tail and inboard wing surfaces to help with controllability in the dive. The aircraft was originally completed with the same R-1535-94 engine used in the production model. However, an accident early on in the test program resulted in the prototype being landed on its belly. This damaged the aircraft sufficiently to warrant a replacement of the engine, and Heinemann took advantage of the circumstance to secure authorization to install the new R1820 GI-33 engine, driving a three-bladed variable pitch propeller. This new engine installation developed 950 horsepower, or 125 horsepower more than the previous one, and made necessary a redesign of the nose section which shortened it and gave it the form seen in the SBD. Initial flight testing, begun in April 1938, however, revealed only minor improvements in performance over the production BT-1. The NACA was once again called upon for assistance, and extensive testing of the new machine was conducted in the Wind Tunnel Langley National Aeronautical Laboratory in Virginia. One of the major changes that came from these tests was the abandonment of the semi-retractable landing gear and its underwing fairings, Placed by a full retraction system in which the main gear legs folded inwards flush into the wings. Many other small design changes were also incorporated into the rebuilt XBT-2, such as superior cockpit instrumentation, which went a long way to enhance the pilot's ability to control the aircraft when flying just above stall speed, as was necessary when landing on a carrier deck. A telescopic sight was included to improve bombing accuracy, and the gun armament was beefed up to two 50 calibers in the nose in addition to a 30 caliber in the rear cockpit. The net result of these minor changes in the airframe produced an aircraft that looked, in almost all respects, like the Dauntless. In fact, this reworked prototype was the direct predecessor of the production Dauntless. Sometime after Northrop left Douglas to form his own company, the designation of the aircraft was changed, and the T in the code, a manufacturer code denoting an aircraft built by Northrop, was replaced by D for Douglas, and an S added before the B, 
SBU is the new Navy prefix denoting single-engine scout-slash-dive bombers. Thus, it was under the designation SBD that the type was accepted for service by the Bureau of Aeronautics in February of 1939. The new plane's fuselage was built of aluminum alloy and four water-type assemblies, each of all-metal stress skin design. The wings and tail surfaces were of similar construction, retaining much of the cellular structure of the BT-1 and incorporating anti-stall slots just behind the leading edges. Like many late 1930s designs, the control surfaces themselves were still fabric covered with metal trim tabs. The two-man crew sat in tandem and the cockpit had flight controls in both positions. It was covered over with a one-piece plastic canopy with three sliding panels. No armor protection was incorporated into the cockpit in this initial model. The bombing crutch on which the main bomb was mounted was redesigned as well as and extended to provide ample clearance for the new larger propeller and the arrestor hook lengthened in view of carital landing experience gained with the BT-1s. These modifications resulted in an aircraft with an all-up weight of about 7,600 pounds, or 3445 kilograms, loaded onto a wing surface of about 320 square feet, or 30 square meters. The aircraft could reach a speed of 265 miles per hour, 425 kph, but normal cruising speed was much less than this, only 155 miles per hour, or 250 kph. In dive bombing configuration with a 1,200 pound bomb load, the aircraft could reach a range of just over 600 miles, or 975 kilometers. In scout bomber configuration with a smaller payload, the aircraft was able to achieve a range of 1,485 miles, or almost 2,400 kilometers. This performance was well in advance of what the Navy was flying at the time, but it was still considered inadequate, especially the range with full bomb load. Nonetheless, the decision to order the aircraft was taken in order to get some modern carrier bombers into service and have their potential evaluated by Navy and Marine flyers while development work continued. On the 8th of April 1939, just a little bit less than a year after the XBT-2's first flight, 144 of the new dive bombers were ordered under the designation SBD-1. The first of these would come off the assembly line at El Segundo in April 1940. In the meantime, a new version of the R-1820 radial rated at 1,000 horsepower had become available, and the aircraft were completed with these. In addition, a pair of 15-gallon auxiliary fuel tanks were fitted, boosting the aircraft's total internal fuel storage to 210 gallons, 795 liters, and going some way towards extending its range. The production SVD made its first flight on the 1st of May, and the first aircraft reached active squadrons on the 6th of September. The first 57 would be delivered to the Marine Corps. The remaining 87 would be completed to an improved standard as SBD-2s and would go to the Navy. During this time, the SBD received its official name, and the Dauntless was truly born. During this time, between acceptance and entry into service, the dive bombing concept had been entirely vindicated in actual warfare abroad. During this time, the Ju-87 Stuka had demonstrated beyond question the utility of the dive bomber as a tactical strike weapon. As part of the combined air armor striking force, Stuka had been instrumental in destroying the armed forces of Poland, and had continued the success in the shockingly rapid German victories over the Scandinavian countries and, most recently, France itself. The same campaigns had also demonstrated the ineffectiveness of the kind of level bombing and ground attack tactics used by the RAF and the French Air Force, at least using the aircraft available to them at the time. Specifically in terms of the war at sea, the American ideas of the dive bomber as perhaps the most effective way to hit ships from the air was shown to be true in battles in the coastal waters of Europe, where the Stukas took an unexpectedly high toll of warships and merchant vessels alike. The British fleet air arm also recorded success with its dive bombers, right as the first Dauntlesses were coming off the assembly line. On the 10th of April, 1940, Blackburn skewers of numbers 800 and 803 squadrons blasted the German cruiser Königsberg as it lay in the harbor of Bergen on the Norwegian coast, sinking her. It seemed the dive bomber concept had proven itself, though few in the American Navy would have been very excited about the way they had been proven correct. And I think this is a good place to end this episode. I hope you find some of this interesting and useful. When we return to the career of the SBD, we'll take a look at its pre-war service and continuing development, and examine the critical battles against the Japanese in 1942 in which the Dauntless earned its reputation as perhaps the most important naval strike aircraft of the war. So I hope you'll join me for that. Next time, however, we'll return to Spanish Morocco and continue with our account of the Rift Wars, take a look at the bloody actions in which the Spanish and their Moroccan antagonists engaged as the former attempted to reassert their control over the rebellious territory. 
This phase of the conflict would play an important role in the evolution of Spanish politics, leading to the rise of the military dictatorship of Primo de Rivera, and indirectly to the fall of the Bourbon monarchy and the rise of Spanish fascism. Until then, I remain Mark Seven, wishing you all the best.